With the authority of the Council, I shall now confer the degree of Doctor of the University, and I call upon the Vice Chancellor, Professor Roy Webb, to read the citation. Chancellor, Vicki Wilson was born in February 1965. I think with Mr. Beat here, Vicki should be standing. But that's not her fault. <laughs> she wouldn't mind coming forward here. Thank you. Vicki Wilson was born in February 1965 in Brisbane and was educated at Balmoral State High School and the Queensland University of Technology from which she embarked on her career as a teacher with Education Queensland. Encouraged by her family, Vicky showed great enthusiasm for sport from an early age. She began playing A-grade netball at the age of 16 and was selected for the Queensland Under-19 team in 1982. Following her selection to the Australian Under-21 team, she received further training at the Australian Institute of Sport. In recognition of her outstanding talent and leadership qualities, Vicky was appointed captain of the Queensland netball team in 1988, a position she held for 10 years. In 1996, she was appointed the captain of the Australian netball team. During an impressive 15-year career, Vicky played 99 tests for Australia, 152 games for Queensland and became the world's greatest goal shooter. She led her team to victories all over the world and the team now holds all major international titles in the sport, including gold medals at the Commonwealth Games and the World Championships. In 1999, Vicky Wilson became the first Australian to play in four successive netball world championships. During her career, she received many sporting accolades, including the 1993 Queensland Sportswoman of the Year, and the Australian Netball of the Year in 1994. Although Vicky retired from netball in 1999, she maintains a close association with sporting activities. Her expertise as an elite athlete and her experience in sports management have allowed her to, allowed her to make significant contributions to sport in a number of key positions. As well as her appointment to the position of School Sports Promotion Officer, Education Queensland, and more recently as Senior Manager of the Department of the Premier and Cabinet, Senior Project Manager. She's also served as a Ministerial Policy Advisor to the Minister for Tourism, Sport and Racing. In addition, she is currently a member of the Queensland Academy of Sport Board, the Brisbane Cricket Ground Trust Board and the Australian Institute of Sport Advisory Board. Vicky is a remarkable role model on and off the court demonstrating an unfailing commitment to whatever she does. Her coaching clinics and talent camps provide inspiration for aspiring netballers. She's actively involved with a number of community organisations and is a member of the Queensland Centenary Federation Committee and the Women's Sport Queensland Committee. As a member of the National Breast Cancer Centre Women's Advisory Network, Vicki Wilson has been a strong supporter of the Centre's fundraising efforts for breast cancer research. Vicki's achievements in sport have been recognised with numerous prestigious awards, including the Medal of the Order of Australia in 1992, as well as the Australian Achiever Award and Premier's Millennium Award in 2000. It is particularly fitting that the Council of Griffith University should honour Vicky Wilson in recognition of her distinguished contributions to sport and to the community. Chancellor, it is with very great pleasure that I present to you Vicky Wilson for admission to the degree of Doctor of the University. I'd now like to call upon Ms. Vicki Wilson, OAM, Doctor of the University, to deliver the occasional address.
The Chancellor, Ms Lenine Ford. The Vice-Chancellor, Professor Roy Webb. Academics and members of the Griffith University Council, graduates and guests. I am deeply flattered and moved to receive this honour, particularly when I look at the list of previous recipients. I'm especially pleased to receive this honour in the presence of my family and friends. My mum always said she wanted a doctor in the family. I note that one of the previous recipients of this honour was Barry Humphreys, who, in his Dame Edna Everidge guide, said in 1975 that it was comforting for Australians to have a medical man as a Deputy Prime Minister. He was, of course, referring to Gough Whitlam's deputy, Dr Jim Cairns, who was definitely not, as students of politics and maybe students of economics will know, a doctor of medicine. Those of you who know me well know that I've spent a lot of time in doctor's surgeries and in hospitals getting treated for sports injuries, but that is about as much as I know about medicine. To receive such an honour and to join the list of such distinguished people is beyond my wildest dreams. I'm particularly grateful to be honoured for doing something that I love being involved with, netball. As I said, there has been a very distinguished list of people who have similarly been acknowledged by Griffith University. I note that I will be the third athlete joining Yvonne Gulagong Corley, who was honoured in 1996, and Greg Norman, who received his degree for service in 1998. I do not class myself in the same ranks as those two extraordinary athletes, but I want to use them as examples to show the changing face of sport and its increasing role in marketing and commerce. Let's start with Yvonne. As most of you would know, Yvonne was a tennis player of exceptional talent at a time when grace, speed and anticipation dominated rather than the power game of, the, of Martina Hingis or the Williams sisters. For more than a decade, Yvonne was consistently in the world top ten. She won the Australian Open four times, the French Open once, and Wimbledon twice. The Wimbledon victories came nine years apart, 1971 and 1980, after she had given birth, making her the first mother to win Wimbledon. In total, Yvonne won 43 singles and nine doubles titles and prize money of almost 1.4 million US dollars. Some might say that's not bad for 10 years work, but let's compare that with Martina Hingis. In the six years since Martina turned pro, she has amassed almost 15.5 million US dollars. Martina won almost 3.5 million last year alone. The difference in winnings between Martina and Yvonne cannot be measured in ability. It is simply a matter of marketing, both of the, of the sport and the players. Let's look at Greg Norman, one of the most talented golfers ever. But how does he compare in winnings with arguably the greatest of them all, Jack Nicklaus? According to the latest prize money list for the US Professional Golfers Association Tour, Greg has earned more than 13.3 million. That is on the US tour alone, which puts Greg at number five in the all-time US PGA tour rankings. Top spot, naturally, is Tiger Woods with around 23 million. But what of Jack Nicklaus, the golden bear, whose legendary feats are just that, legendary? Jack comes in at number 60 on the US PGA Tour all-time prize money list with 5.7 million. No one can tell me that Greg, who still says that Jack Nicklaus is his all-time hero, is that much of a better player than the Golden Bear. Particularly when you consider we are talking about the US Tour, which Nicklaus made his own during his heyday. Again, the difference is marketing, both of the, of the sport and the player. I've only mentioned money earned from playing so far. The prize pool has grown for almost every sport you could name. Even once amateur-only sports like rugby union, surf lifesaving and athletics offer lucrative prizes and money. There are countless examples of modern athletes earning big money from their chosen sport. Sadly, I'm not one of them. I still have to work for a living, but I'm better off than many of my predecessors in netball. While I was playing, I did, 
I did have sponsorship deals for a range of things, including a car, white goods, training equipment and clothing. Not exactly in the Greg Norman League, but every bit helped during my playing career. Sponsorship of athletes has grown perhaps even faster than prize pools. Greg Norman earns more off the golf course than he does on it. So too does Jack Nicholas, even though he's playing on the lucrative Masters circuit. And despite his phenomenal winning record to date, Tiger Woods also earns more off the course than on it. Annual sponsorship deals for Martina Hingis are also in the neighbourhood of seven figures, which isn't a bad neighbourhood. And that is the real money spinner for athletes and for people such as you, the new generation of commercial and financial investors, merchant bankers and stockbrokers. It's the making and taking of these sponsorship deals that have turned sport and modern athletes into businesses bigger than some listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. In fact, some sports clubs like English soccer clubs are listed on the British Stock Exchange. Maybe that trend will come to Australia. I cannot see why not. There are some very bankable sports clubs in Australia and they are bankable because they are run as professional outfits. They are run as companies, complete with professional board of directors, chief executives and highly trained backroom staff. The Brisbane Broncos' on-field success since the club's inception in 1998 is due to a combination of on-field talent and backroom br brilliance. The same could be said of AFL clubs like Essendon and Carlton, and even the Brisbane Lions who, while yet to still win a flag, are showing that on-field results will follow once there is a stable and professional off-field management setup. I was interested to read an, a recent article in the Courier-Mail in which the merits of sports sponsorship were starkly put into context. According to a survey of 1,500 people by Sweeney Sports Report, public interest has risen in sports in which Australia won gold medals at last year's Olympic Games. And that means Australia's most bankable athlete is Ian Thorpe. Considering this survey was conducted before the Thorpedo cleaned up at the recent Australian swimming titles, I would say that Ian is even more the golden boy now. Number two in the survey was Pat Rafter, followed by Cathy Freeman, Susie O'Neill, Steve Waugh, Michael Klim, Kieran Perkins, Greg Norman, Grant Hackett, Andrew Gaze, Curry Webb and Paralympian Louise Savage. For the record, the glamour athlete of Sydney, the rose-tattooed pole vaulter, Tatiana Grigorieva, was number 16, four ahead of tennis heartthrob Mark Philippoussis. The survey also found that people did recognise sponsors, which is just as well. No sponsors, no sports. Top of the list of the most recognised sponsor was Uncle Toby's with 56%. That is, very, uh, that is a very high recognition rate, particularly when you consider next best was Nike with 34% and Ford with 33%. Coca-Cola was 10th with 20% recognition, which was a little surprising, considering the soft drink spends millions around the world on sponsorships and in straight advertising. I do not wish to bore you with surveys, but a poll by Performance Research after the 1999 Rugby World Cup showed that Coca-Cola did not take full advantage of its sponsorship with a recognition rate of only 26%. BT, or Bankers Trust, also knocked on with 21% recognition. Guinness was the only sponsor to score with fans with an amazing 94% recognition rate. I'm not sure if that says more about the marketing approach of Guinness or the drinking habits of rugby fans. Maybe a little of both. Another survey found that smart sponsors of sport and athletes are not only recognised but are applauded by the public. This survey done at the Sydney Olympics by Performance Research found that most patrons were all for companies spending millions of dollars to be official sponsors. And 34% believed that sponsorship made a valuable contribution to the Olympics and then said, I quote, it makes me feel better about sponsors. Translating that sentiment into cash sales is another matter, but at least the consumer is at the starting line. It may not sound like much of an advantage or any advantage over a competitor, but there must be something in sponsorship. 
Research group IEG Network believes that sponsorship is the world's fastest growing form of marketing. If you doubt that is fact, ponder this. IEG's international survey found that corporations around the world would spend $24.6 US billion this year to sponsor sport, arts, entertainment, various causes and events. I suppose it brings us back to where I started, where I compared the winnings of past and present greats of sport. There is no doubt that more money is flowing into sport and being paid to individual athletes than ever before. And the trend will continue. What better place to market tennis shoes than on the feet of Martina Hingis? Does Tiger Woods ever wear a hat without the Nike brand on the front? And how is it that Greg Norman can turn the most feared of all sharks, the Great White, into the most sought label in the world for golfing apparel? Perhaps the perfect person to promote running spikes might be Christopher Scase. <laughs> to conclude, I'd like to leave you with these thoughts. How many pairs of tennis shoes would Adidas sell if Puma sponsored Martina Hingis? And how many caps would Nike sell if ASIC sponsored Tiger Woods? <laughs>